Okay. So I'd like to introduce everyone to Amy. Amy Stern is a licensed clinical social worker who uh, specializes in counseling related to adults and geriatrics with grief and loss, including loss of mobility, which many of us are pretty comfortable with. She practices cognitive behavioral therapy to improve behavioral and thought patterns, mindfulness, and other scientifically validated psychotherapy techniques to enhance mental health. She has also been part of the TGCT community for years, um, and she'll explain more on how she has been a part of that. And uh, Amy, I will put up your slides for you. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. All right, Amy, um, I will let you get started. All right. Well, it's good to be with all of you. And um, said thank you for asking me to be a part of this. Um, so our topic today is living with chronic illness. And I will just jump in. Uh, chronic illness is, of course, the personal experience of living with chronic disease. And chronic disease is broadly defined as a condition which lasts a year or more which impacts activities of daily living and or which requires ongoing treatment. And according to the CDC, six in 10 Americans live with one or more chronic diseases. And two thirds of US adults have chronic disease or live with a loved one with a chronic disease. And I do wanna add that um, my entree into this topic is um, there are a few different reasons that I'm interested. Um, the first is that um, in my young adulthood, uh, my mom lived with cancer for many years. And of course, Sydney is my niece and she has been living with TGCT since 2014. Um, as a result of my learning about living with illness, I subsequently got involved with hospice and palliative care and have continued in my private practice to um, specialize in working with people impacted by illness. So regardless of disease type, illness impacts all realms of an individual's functioning. And Sid, if you would go to the next slide. Um, in the Journal of Clinical Nursing, um, some authors highlighted the various realms that are commonly affected by chronic illness. Um, they include behavioral and psychological realms involving work, uh, excuse me, coping with illness as well as um, creating an emotionally satisfying life. Um, social and vocational work includes maintaining one's roles and responsibilities as possible by making lifestyle adjustments. And there's existential work involved in recreating and living life meaningfully while simultaneously integrating illness into the context of one's life. And Sid, if you would go to the next one. So, <clears throat> Um, as, you, as you travel the path of integrating illness into your life, I would ask that some of the following be considered um, concepts. The first is allowing versus resisting your experience. Allowing our experiences serves us best. Um, resisting is the struggle that occurs when we believe that our moment-to-moment -moment experience should be something other than what it is. Um, and understandably, because the emotions brought up by illness can be difficult and scary, we're tempted to avoid our feelings, but the psychological literature uh, research rather indicates that resistance to emotion truly blocks um, the improvement of symptoms, psychological symptoms. And um, if you remember nothing from um, the presentation, perhaps the, the following quote may um, be a good takeaway. And that is what we resist persists and what we feel we can heal. 
And in fact, although pain may be inevitable, whether it's emotional, physical, or otherwise, resisting truly causes unnecessary suffering. And when you're able to settle into what is in the present moment, you're, and whatever you're feeling, you eventually begin to identify your needs and how best to meet those needs. And we've included a link uh, to a video entitled Alfred and Shadow, which I think does a good job of explaining that allowing emotions to be there makes them feel more manageable, makes them less unpleasant, certainly helps you to identify what you need and allows you to communicate your feelings to others in order to connect. That link will also be included in the chat at the end of this for you to watch after, and it'll be attached to the recording for those wondering what link. <laughs> Thank you. So common emotions that certainly vary in presentation and intensity uh, that are associated with living with chronic illness are the following, shock, fear, anger, overwhelm, confusion, frustration, anger, grief, isolation, sadness, perhaps guilt or shame. Um, I want to thank Gary from TGCT community for his lovely slide, which um, does a great job of illustrating that um, clearly there are a lot of experiences um, that are below the surface, not visible to most people that um, those living with chronic illness um, sit with. So another um, concept that I would ask you to consider is motivating yourself with self-compassion. And self-compassion is truly no more than treating yourself as you would a good friend. And it truly provides the emotionally supportive environment needed um, for change that's demanded by illness. And unfortunately, in, at least in uh, US culture, we have um, been conditioned to believe that we must pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Um, essentially treating ourselves harshly in order to, um, to take action, um, to motivate us. Um, the reality is that the research demonstrates that self-compassionate people are actually engage in healthier behaviors, are no less likely to have high personal standards and are actually less afraid of failure and more likely to persist in efforts after setbacks. And while the care that you bring to yourself may not immediately banish difficult feelings, supporting yourself is certainly more beneficial than abandoning yourself by telling yourself that you should think or, or not think or feel certain things. And we like to, to encourage people to take good care of themselves. And what I found in my career is that people often don't know how to do that. Um, I subsequently was trained in um, mindful self-compassion, which is a research-backed program that um, introduces mostly experiential exercises um, that are self-compassion practices in order to allow people to identify practices that work for them um, and, and therefore consistently engage in those practices. And um, initially the program was in an eight week format uh, in-person classes. And while it's a wonderful experience, if you can swing it in terms of time and, and resources, financial resources, um, in order to make it more accessible to more people, it is now um, in a workbook format. And additionally, they do have online support available for those that are committed to practicing self-compassion in community. So Sid, if you would proceed. To the next slide. Oops. 
So another thing that I would ask you to consider is to really attend to the quality of your connections. And certainly if you feel lonely, to take care of loneliness. Now, the definition is feeling as if you can't be vulnerable or for fully yourself in, um, around others. It's incredibly common. In fact, a recent Harvard study indicated that 36% of US adults feel lonely, let's see, forgive me, feel serious loneliness frequently or almost all the time. And that didn't account for a higher incidence of loneliness among young people and mothers with children. And certainly those numbers don't take into account the toll of health challenges on one sense of connection or lack thereof. And um, it's, it's obvious that health challenges are some of the many things that can contribute to a feeling of being apart from or not connected with others in a safe way. Um, there are other factors, obviously, that can contribute to loneliness. Um, limited, uh, a limited support network, um, feeling as if you are in a different chapter of life than, than friends or loved ones, or um, differing sense of identities. Um, so, the bottom line is because loneliness is so linked to poor physical and emotional health, it's important to attend to your connections. And if it's not possible to share your emotions with people that you feel trusting of, whether it's family, friends, or others, try to seek out those that may have a greater understanding of your experience, such as the TGCT community and others, uh, other support groups, and additionally, trained mental health professionals. And something that was emphasized by the American Psychological Association in their publication called Coping with a Chronic Illness is to seek help early and as often as possible for coping and stress management challenges, and especially if you have been experiencing stressful life events before diagnosis, and if you have a history of depression. So thank you for proceeding, Sid. Numerous um, sources that were reviewed um, encouraged various ways of managing living with chronic illness, and they include the following. Um, Actively engaging in the management of symptoms and in your health promotion tasks truly helps to promote a sense of control compared, of course, to passively allowing care to be dictated by others. Learn as much as you can about illness, your illness and its treatment. Certainly identify questions and concerns to address with your healthcare team. Feel free to request referrals to other trusted sources of information, other health professionals that may complement care, um, and, and other sources of support in order to feel empowered. Another way of managing that's often encouraged is of course maintaining a healthy lifestyle and uh, it may help to invite friends and families to participate as well and um, by healthy lifestyle I'm mentioning nutrition and physical and leisure activities and stress management and of course avoiding negative coping mechanisms smoking excessive drinking and certainly social isolation or withdrawal. Additional um, ways of managing illness that have been recommended including, include letting go of unnecessary obligations in order to conserve your physical and emotional energy. 
acknowledging your limitations, especially those that aren't re readily observable or below the iceberg as in Gary's slide, in order to feel more at ease to honor those limitations when necessary. And also consider letting go of relationships that no longer serve you. And Sid, if you would go to the next. Finally, savor your courage and achievements and the things that you are genuinely appreciative of. Uh, rank your daily priorities, including enjoyable activity for goodness sake, and set realistic short-term goals and celebrate your achievements in order to promote your sense of progress and success. And practicing gratitude. Deliberately, consistently focusing your attention in this way and enables you to broaden your experience to truly ex feel that there is good that exists as well as the challenges. And eventually, it, gratitude practice can rewire your brain to attend to things for which you're grateful in a more automatic way. And finally, be gentle with yourself also, ultimately and know that you will adapt and thrive over time. And take advantage please of all the resources that exist, starting with what's available through TGCT and LifeRaft. Um, they have a wonderful di uh, digital library, which includes um, a doctor checklist, questions to ask um, your doctor, managing your care checklist, and an entire patient handbook about navigating care. And additionally, uh, on March 15th, we are gonna be discussing um, related concepts and methods for coping with chronic pain. And we invite all of you to join that as well. And perhaps I've gone too quickly, but um, I hope not. And my intention was to allow plenty of time for questions. So I would love to open it up for questions. And I believe Sid that you've already fielded some or? Yep, you did great. Um, so just also a special thank you um, to Amy for her time. Let me make sure she is spotlighted. Um, we wanna see her face predominantly. Um, <laughs> And so we do have a question that uh, where would you draw the line, so to speak, as to your normal response to a condition and when you should seek like actual help for a condition? At what point is it a uh, more than just an everyday stress? You know, I think I think you can use your own intuition if it feels overwhelming. In my mind, there's no need to sit with that. Um, and, and that's a good indicator to reach out. If it feels as if um, the challenge that you're experiencing is interfering with things that you need and wish to do, that's another good indicator that it's time to reach out. Well, thank you. I also, for those wondering what link um, Amy was mentioning, I put it in the chat. We just didn't have enough time to include it, but uh, in the recording, it'll also be included. Um, so another question about uh, what would you recommend for those in situations where they may want to approach their provider regarding care or even mental health aspects, but the provider seems to maybe downplay or belittle the situation, which we commonly see across rare diseases, particularly even GIST or TGCT or Snowville chondromatosis, like all of them, we see this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I hate that that's a common experience. You know, oftentimes providers have um, other folks in their offices, whether they be social workers or nurse practitioners, um, physician assistants, a lot of those other folks are more aware of people's need for support um, and additional information than sometimes physicians are. 
Um, so um, I think tapping into that, those folks would be useful. Um, the reality is illness affects all realms of functioning and feel free to use that verbiage. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an incredibly challenging task to figure out how to integrate illness into the context of one's life. And it's absolutely understandable that people are looking for additional information and support. So that is what I would reiterate <laughs> with a provider. So similarly, if you have maybe a family member or a loved one or a friend that doesn't seem to be getting it, maybe they relate um, your mobility issues or your chemotherapy treatment to something more benign than it actually feels like. Do you have a suggestion on how to bridge that gap in knowledge for that person and how to maybe help them show some compassion? Well, I certainly would. Um ask them if they are willing to um, take a look at information that supports the fact that this is a challenging experience that is multifaceted and has both observable effects and plenty that are not observable, but still impact quality of life and energy and so on. So um, encouraging them if they are willing to take a look at whatever you might be able to present um, could perhaps go a long way. Do you have any evidence or research that you know of that shows the relation of mental health and mental aspects, mental duress affecting physical healing? You know, I wish that I was more versed than I am, and I wish I could reel off tons of things, but there are plenty of um, health psychologists. I think of Kelly McGonigal, who probably has information about that in some of her material. Um, a client just introduced me to a UK podcaster, um, Kimberly Wilson. Um, who I believe may also have plenty of information in that regard. I'm sorry that I can't offer more specific citations. Do you see uh, more like, um, do you see an overall trend? Does like the mental aspects or mental distress affect your ability to heal? I think, I think there's increasing um, attention given to the fact that emotional health plays a huge role in physical health and, a, and an overall sense of well-being. Um, so I have seen a shift in people's willingness to acknowledge the connection. Well, that's one step closer, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So if someone realizes that they have a problem, that they are overwhelmed, um, do you have any suggestion on resources on where they should go if there's a hotline or any information? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are plenty of um, professional associations that can offer referrals. I happen to be a social worker. So the Na National Association of Social Workers comes to mind, the American Psychiatric Association. There's plenty of other um, professional associations related to counseling, marriage and family therapy. Um, additionally, obviously, if you have insurance, you have earned, <laughs> you have earned that insurance and ideally would be able to use it in order to tap into behavioral health resources. So contacting your insurance company's behavioral health department would be a way to go. Um, obviously, people often like to know that, um, know who they're being referred to and that can feel um, challenging, um, getting referrals from people who have been satisfied with their providers is often a nice way to get, um, satisfactory referrals. Um, I'm familiar, most familiar with the online resource psychology today, which allows you to connect with providers as well as support groups and other types of facilities. Um, by searching on your insurance coverage, issues you wish to have addressed, um, gender of the therapist, and so on. 
Um, so all of the, and in fact, um, uh, also for affordable treatment, Mental Health America has what they call an affiliate resource center where you put in your location and you're directed to um, sources of therapy as well. So there are a lot of different opportunities for, for getting referrals. And again, you know, you may well have somebody in your provi healthcare provider's office that could offer referrals as well. Um, and for those wondering, there's also 988 in the United States as a crisis line for anyone who needs immediate help as well. Um, love our crisis lines. There's also text options if you're not in a comfortable position to talk. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's the national suicide hotline. Um, yep. And they see non-suicide based comments as well. Um, so uh, for, for people who love you, um, who have decided that they are 100 and 10% on the Stern bus, um, would being able to correct, uh, connect with you directly be an option for them? Uh, sure, absolutely. I welcome that. I, I, Sid has my email and, and uh, cell, which is my everything. And anyone's welcome to reach out. I always enjoy being a resource for people, even if it's just to direct to other sources of information or if it's to be a listening ear. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for your time today. Um, and for those wondering, at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, one week from today on Wednesday, we will have uh, Managing Chronic Pain and other um, mindfulness-based tactics and techniques on how to get through your daily life in that aspect. Um, but this is a wonderful preview, I think, of uh, navigating chronic disease and chronic illness. So thank you for everyone uh, for your time. Um, and I. We'll also have this recording up hopefully uh, in within an hour or so. So thank you, um, thank everyone. Take good care. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>